the clap thing, that means it's already rolling. So okay. we've started. All right. So cool. here we are, uh, back at Hat Studio and uh, Hang Fam. Yes, that's so, me. So before my, before my other Vietnamese friends give me a hard time about the pronunciation, um, that that is the that's the uh, that's the right way, right? That's the that's the right that's, way. That's so. But but yeah. you just told a few minutes ago. You just told a little story about. The, yeah, I mean, growing up, you yeah. know, you don't want to be made fun of, right? And hang is just like, you know, there's too many variations of hang uh, yeah. as a kid, right? And so I just said, you sure. know what, let me, do, let, me, let me change it and be hong. Yeah. And so I was hong from third, first grade, basically all the way up until like eighth grade. Right. When one of my other Vietnamese friends yeah. was just like, wait, you spell your name with an A, not an O. What do you, yeah. your name is Hang, not yeah. Hong. You're you know? not in the old country, right. <laughs> yeah, own it, you know, you call yourself Hang. Hey. And, um, it's, well, it's good because you have a great email address too, right, which is Hang Tough, Hang and Tough. Hang and Tough. Hang and Tough. Yeah. Uh, so, but if, if you're in Vietnam though, how would they say it? Hang. Okay, so it's, it's you've like got in between. Bite, hang, yeah, you've got to bite hang. down like Hang. Hang. Yeah, hang. and my whole name is actually Pham Thi Bic Hang. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Can you say that? <laughs> Pham Thi Bic but Pham Thi what? What was the rest of it? Pham Thi Bic Hang. Bic Hang. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the other thing too. And if uh, anybody goes back in time with me um, from the military, my uh, all of my records is Bic Hang. And the Bic is actually pronounced as such. Yeah. But whenever it's spelled, it's B-I-C-H. Yeah. So I got all sorts of bitch hang like <laughs> yeah. like yeah. I, I couldn't do that. Do you so get whenever house and hanging cuz I feel like that one probably I, is Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my so my <clears throat> I, I, all right, so true story. My uh, Vietnamese is limited mainly to knowing how to order food in in a Vietnamese restaurant. That's pretty good. And, and I'm impressed, Michael. Well, well so <laughs> so my so my my go to is pho dak biet. And that's my favorite. And I just um, had that today, by the way, for lunch. And that's it's not the good. same everywhere. No. Like no. And, and so here's so so we live out in the in, in the burbs and mm -hmm. nowadays, of course, in Houston. How long have you been in Houston? Don't age me, but uh, okay. since nineteen eighty four. Since nineteen eighty four. So you were two. Yes. And um <clears throat> Uh, uh, so back then, mm -hmm. there there wasn't uh, there weren't Vietnamese restaurants all over the suburbs mm -hmm. like 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 there is now. Yeah. There was only they were only kind of in town in, in what we now call Midtown that used to be not all fancy and correct. You know, and so yes. and, and that was when I discovered like, like Vietnamese food is really good, right? And, and back then you used to be able to get like banh mi for a dollar fifty. Good and, for you! Um, wow, I'm, this yeah, is great. Yeah, and so, so now though we have so my wife and I have mm -hmm. there's this one there's a Vietnamese restaurant that we've been going to near our house for years and mm -hmm. they, well we don't even we don't they don't even give us the menus they just ask when we walk in they just say are you having water or hot tea today and mm -hmm. we depending on the weather we say what we want and they know the rest yeah and so and they're always and they're impressed that like we know how to pronounce the the, the things. And so I had to tell them the story about how it used to be yeah. that we didn't have Vietnamese in the suburbs. You had to go in town and they didn't always have the English like on the menu. So you had to kind of, I mean, they had it, they had it written in uh, Latin <clears throat> letters, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like the Vietnamese alphabet. It was, mm -hmm. but, but it was like, you had to, you had to learn how to say it. Otherwise, they Correct. just make fun and of you. And it's got the different so, uh, accent marks the and the squiggly lines and, and stuff, right? And I know we like yeah. we probably don't sound right. Like I know my friends. You sound way Spanish. better than a few other people yeah, I know yeah, that yeah. try to say Might it right. In this room, mm -hmm. but, but um, uh, anyway, so that's that's my that's the extent of my of my videos. But now I also know how to say your ha, ha, hang, hang hang yeah. Okay. So hang is is just kind of the the easy short way to say it, Jeez, and then yeah. hang in English. And a lot of people even in my company or just people that I meet, yeah. they still try to call me Hong. And yeah. uh, it's okay. I guess I take yeah. it either I mean, you way. Can't. Yeah. You gotta roll with it. All right, yeah. so we did enough on your name. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> what, uh, but, so you, but, but you weren't born here. No. But, right, so you came here from, from Vietnam. So, right. I, so I have it on good authority because, uh, by the way, the way that we met, and we've only known each other now for about nine seconds. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> but 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 you're an FOC, right? You're a friend of Chris, Chris Bentley, <laughs> who's who's uh, who's been on the show twice now. Except one of them hasn't published yet. It's going to publish probably in another. <sighs> he just loves the cameras yeah. and all of the talking. He, he loves the cameras so, so much, much he might even be in this room. And oh, we, he and might. We, and we might get him. <laughs> 
<laughs> we might get him to join us in a little while. He he did also bring come bearing gifts, which I always like. So uh, so the story. But what he told me when he said you got to have hang on your show because mm-hmm. uh, she's got this amazing story. It starts in Vietnam, obviously. So let's start there, mm-hmm. uh, and then we'll figure out how that connects to our whole American Dream idea. Okay. So. So yeah, so um, 84. It all started when? Nah. <laughs> well, actually, my mom, and I think this is uh, one of the inspirations behind why we decided to go with um, writing a children's book, right? Because we want to preserve that history, but make it so that it's it's friendly for all oh, yeah. ages, right? We didn't say children's book. We mm-hmm. said that before the cameras turned on. Okay. So you wrote a children's book. I co-wrote it with my sister, actually. She found yeah, inspiration. That still counts as writing. That's yeah, okay. yeah. And she found gonna... the illustrator and everything. Yeah. And this is like a real, legit Vietnamese illustrator from Vietnam. Yeah. Right? And so <clears throat> she did amazing on, on the illustrations. And yeah. So I'm going to get it. So I got to buy a copy and, mm-hmm. and put it down here in the... I've already... This is where the... Everybody who's been on the show who's written a book... Mm-hmm. Uh, they they got their I got their books. Yes, you can add both, it to the collection. It's on Amazon or okay on Barnes and Nobles. Now, do so. I have to do like with Chris, where I had to buy the hardcover version? Can no, I just get the no, ours is one? very nice and simple, seven ninety nine. And oh yeah, it's a deal. Yes, I you might, can buy twenty if you want, and that still be <laughs> not as costly as Chris Bentley's book, right? Okay, so let's talk. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so the book. All right, so you want to start with the book? Why'd you write a book? Why'd you write a how'd you end up writing a book? So the book is actually going to be. It's called the middle child, right? Because I am, in fact, the middle child. There's five of us growing up. And um, oh, that, okay, so that's fun because usually when people say middle child, you usually think of three and one in the middle, but five also has a middle. <clears throat> I'm right smack in the middle. Which I'm the like daughter, and I had fun. two older brothers and two younger siblings, a younger sister and a younger brother. Okay, so I'm just like right there in the middle. Yeah, so. yeah. So I mean, the idea is um, obviously to to just capture the story, and then also to <clears throat> start with one. And create a few following after yeah. that, right? So, um, the one that we just did was about hanging tough, the Marine, and um, you know it talks about you know my fateful 19 seconds inside of a bunker in at Al Jabra, Kuwait, yeah. when the sirens just went off, and I'm like praying to God, right? I mean, we're in like. A, bunker 20 people deep and that's the right person to pray to by the way it's, yeah i mean it's yeah. it's, it's crazy yeah. right and and i feel like uh, at any moment if there wasn't the you know the um patriot uh, missiles that knocked down the incoming missiles we could have just been doomed right so it was kind of like that where our commanding officer was just like hopefully you have your affairs in order and uh, as a 23 year old you're just like what the hell does that mean you know like <laughs> yeah. um. Well, all right. Yeah. So you found out real quick, right? Um, and did you do the like the one page will before you went over there? Like you do the like the yeah, I did so yeah. Once upon a time, long time ago, when I was in the Air Force, and mm-hmm. and, um, and oh, I, that's I great. you're a veteran I, too, huh? I didn't do anything exciting in mm-hmm. the Air Force. It was well, it was um, I, I almost did some exciting things, but I but I didn't um, because it, uh, let's see, I went into I went. It was 1990 when I went in, so I was enlisted. So because I, I was. Um, I was uh, still trying to figure out like how to like uh, we had got married like really young and had kids like I was 22 years old with you know Seriously? with one and one on the way and trying to figure out how to like how to like pay for you know little things like food yeah. and um, <laughs> yeah. and uh, like, I, I, and I thought well I'll go into the military because which is something that I I never wasn't I wasn't really predisposed to do that like at that mm-hmm. point in my life I couldn't imagine why anybody would do that on purpose and so uh, but I did and uh, it was 1990 and you know what happened in 1990 well maybe yeah, that oh, was yeah. that was the beginning of uh, oh, yeah. originally Desert Shield and the <clears throat> anyway uh, I ended up I ended up being just in Florida because the unit that I got deployed to after tech school or that I went to after they had already deployed to the desert. So I was just kind of there, like not doing anything. Oh, um, wow. So, but I do remember the little like one page, like will like, okay, you got to fill this out real quick. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and it's easy because you have nothing. So yeah. what are you going to, you know? Yeah. At that point. I mean, the crazy thing is, is that whenever I joined the Marines and right before my mom allowed me to, to go away. She came with me to the recruiter's office and she was like, you know, told the recruiter, 
promise me that uh, my daughter is not going to be deployed. She's not going to go anywhere. And, <laughs> and she made said, my yeah, aunt translate absolutely. all of this stuff, right? And yeah. of course, the recruiter's like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah just sign right there, you know? Marines and, don't actually <laughs> fight in wars anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? And so uh, we were like all happy, peachy, all right, I'm going to get my Montgomery GI Bill and go to school and, you know. Yeah. And I, I just, thought the same thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was just a totally different experience, but I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, that's how I met Chris. That's how I met um, some of my really sure. lifelong friendships, and sure. same with you, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe not, maybe uh, not. But, <laughs> no. um, but 19 <clears throat> seconds in a bunker, so what happened? So I after got, that, yeah, I went off on a No, I mean, after that, you kind of just feel like, all right, you've got to do something else with your life, right? If If... If God well, lets no. you see the day, right? And, uh, and you're wait, okay. So you lived. Well, so yes, I lived. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Thanks. Thanks be to God. All right, but I'm. Um, you know, I, I did. I had that moment of just reckoning to say, all right, sure. if if I am able to do something, you know, let me help people. Let me contribute. Let me be a productive citizen to society. Yeah. And um, I, I've kind of just always gone back to thinking about that that moment. Yeah. So that's know. that's pivotal. Yeah. And, yeah. So it's yeah. like an anchor, anchor moment. So, yeah. all right. Uh, so you went on. So are we telling? Oh. I mean, it was all clear. The sirens for all clear. You came yeah. out and I was about to die because it was just, you're in your gas mask, right? right. And then you're, you're just almost suffocating because there's and not that were, much. Where were you? You were in Kuwait? I was no. in Al Jabra, Kuwait, and this was the most concentrated. Nice and cool, the weather there. And, it and, was and the hot. Mask. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh! I remember building. I mean, not not as bad as what Chris has done. I'm pretty yeah. sure he can tell you some of the stories. But um, we were building sandbags, and I would get blisters from just tying the the sandbags. Right. And right. Um, you know, so it's just stuff like that that just really kind of humbles you and makes you feel like, oh, well, this yeah. is this yeah. is a different kind of experience, right? And I think it. it it does. If it doesn't kill you, it definitely makes you stronger, right? Sure. Um, so one thing that has come up on this show already um, in in the nine or ten episodes that we've done um, is this kind of recurring theme of perspective. Yeah. And a lot of times, and uh, Americans, like especially the ones that are from here mm -hmm. originally, um, and uh, oftentimes are lacking perspective hmm. either because we haven't lived in other parts of the world or because we don't have those military or other kind of extreme circumstances mm -hmm. where we just sort of go like 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 we go happily along and then we find like really dumb things to bitch about right absolutely um, <laughs> this is <laughs> so all right so so yes. there's a knowing look there so what it, what it i mean my thing lately is that um you know, my husband and I, we talk about hardships and hardship yeah. building character. And, um, you know, aside from working for a great company, I also own a couple of yogurt shops, right? So oh, yeah. I employ people. And I find that uh, there's such a big gap between, you know, the youth of today and the youth of maybe 10, 15, two, two decades ago, right? Yeah. So, so what is that? What is that? I mean, I, I think <clears throat> I know what you mean, but... What does it's, it look it's like? It's disheartening, right? Because people don't know how to work from the bottom anymore. And uh, if you're given an opportunity to make some money, right? And if you're still living under your parents' roof, work, come in, do the best that you can. But everybody has a, a way to say, oh, I've got an out. You know, I don't have to. You know, I don't feel like it, right? And it's, it's just too easily... Um, you know, caving into the whims of their feelings or their emotions, or they don't feel like it. Like nobody has that discipline. Like, like we they should. Yeah, because right? how I feel is the most important thing. About yeah, it. and um, that's terrible. <laughs> so one one of the things about one of the kind of core tenets of the concept of the American dream mm -hmm. is that we have the the you know going back early on was that each generation would be able to do better than their parents, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. was just sort of like built into the mindset is like parents work so that their kids, and not just to make it easier for my kids so that they have a better life, but but the, the kids grow up in each generation because things are kind of getting better as we go, mm -hmm. that uh, each each generation can do better than the one before. Mm -hmm. um, At least you try to set them up that way, right? Yeah, yeah. But it seems like we're losing that. Well, I think we're regressing thread. a little bit, right? I, yeah. I, I find that, um, 
You know, raising children here, it's particularly challenging, right? Because we're we're in a in an age of we have everything, and it's it's an yeah. age of convenience, right? And yeah. there's a lot of um, just whining and complaining, right? Yeah. When you don't get certain things your way, there's conveniences that were afforded here um, <clears throat> that aren't offered anywhere else, right? I lived in Penang, Malaysia for a few years, mm. and the fact that there's not a one-stop shop like Walmart was just like, wow, yeah. I could I could create this concept over yeah. here and people would love it, right? right. But right. If you want um, paper, you go to the paper store. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Specialty shops remained, specialty shops, sorry. Um, and, and that's the thing, right? Like over here, you have everything that's just been revolutionized by yeah. uh, good supply chain systems. And capitalism does a lot to spur, you know, spur growth, right? Um, there are some drawbacks to to the system, though. Yeah. Right. And I think, um, you know, sometimes you, you do have, again, right, like so many conveniences that, you know, children are just thought that, OK, this is OK. I can have a uh, smoked salmon for breakfast every day. And, um, sure. you know, when I don't have it, I'm going to complain and, and cry about it. Right. And that's not I, supposed you know, to be, you know, I haven't, I haven't heard <laughs> smoked salmon be the the thing for kids <laughs> maybe well, my maybe son. your family <laughs> i'm thinking this is a personal uh, reference because uh, usually it's chicken nuggets but um, uh all right so i want to get into all right let, let's um uh let's come back to the discussion about the system because i think that's really interesting especially when somebody has a, a perspective other than this the typical one mm-hmm. um but uh, before we do that Let's go back. Uh, we'll tap a couple loose ends here. So uh, a little more about because I think your story is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't. You started talking about the book, so you wrote the book. We did. So that one's published, and it's that published. was uh, part one. And then uh, we're working on a second one. Yeah. And that one is going to talk about um, the journey, right, from the motherland, right, Vietnam. And, yeah. you know, after the fall of Saigon, you know, there was a mass exodus of just people trying to leave, right? Yeah, yeah. And so from there, you know, our family had tried many times to escape. But you've got the Viet Congs that are, you know, at different checkpoints. And every time we tried, we had four attempts of trying to flee the country. And So has everybody <clears throat> who's come here, for, does, this is funny because I know lots and lots of uh Vietnamese people, but is everybody still escaping? How are they? How's everybody getting here? I mean, it's a, it's a lot more open now, right? right? Like a, yeah, but, but you know, but even in the eighties, you were in the eighties. We were having to leave, to right? Leave. And, and we were having to leave quietly, right? Because if they caught you, and they knew this is what was happening, and people that had some savings and had some money, that's what they were doing. And they were like, you know, we can't stay in a country that's gonna be communist, take some of our, right. our rights away. Um, I mean, fast forward to where we are now, Vietnam's definitely a lot more open. Yeah. They're open to trade. And right, uh, right, this right. is the main thing. They're open to educating their citizens, which is, again, another pillar to, you know, spawn some economic kind growth, right? right? So, so well, you guys made it. <clears throat> We made it by by the grace of God, right? I think we were on a boat and uh, my mom, this is maybe a spoiler alert, um, but in the story, we'll talk about basically how, you know, my brother and I were the only kids on that boat and there was probably about 30 people on the boat. And the only reason why we were saved, because at that time, there were all of these, you know, little mini pontoon boats that were in the ocean, the South China Sea. And we were luckily saved by like a Norwegian. So you're not like uh, a big, like, like, no, no. I mean, at any point, like some people lost their lives because the the boats capsized or they didn't have enough water. And uh, how far did you have to get on the little boat before you got to something bigger? I mean, those details are from my mom. I mean, she tells me these stories. And so I'm just retelling you from how I I know that I'm here. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're in the, you're out in the ocean. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And she said that the the reason why we were saved was because the boat captain was like, you know, woman, put your, your children on your shoulder and, you know, let them, you know, see us that we've got women and children and uh, they might have a little bit of mercy and come yeah. and save us, right? Because again, we're, we're just a bunch. We're a dime a dozen, a bunch of boats just, and so a boat stopped and we were, we were picked up, right? And this is... This is how we ended up in Malaysia, not 
in Indonesia for a few months before yeah. they processed all the paperwork so that we can come to Houston. Um, to, yeah. Right. So I remember Houston vividly um, in '84 because it was August 3rd, right before my uh, my fourth birthday, that I had arrived. Uh, and that's wow. what it said on my resident alien card. Yeah. And so I just, I'll, I'll always remember that. And so, there's pictures so of when. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but you remember it. I, I, I remember mean, it I remember, but I mean, sometimes some things just impact you so much. Yeah, that, sure. That you remember. Sure. Yeah. All right. All right. So, so, so where, so where do we go from there? Do you want to, you want to, you want to fast forward to any, any, any good stuff between there and when you went in the Marines? I mean, a, a lot of things, right? Uh, just being in America, though, I find that there's a lot of there's a lot of good things, right? We we, you know, grew up in a nice neighborhood where there were people that came from churches and came, you know, our neighbors would come right. and offer us things, and it was just very warm. Yeah, yeah. So me as an immigrant. I, I strongly detest the whole like turn the immigrants away, right? Because they they went through some strife, yeah, sure. to get here, right? I mean, should we have some sort of a calculated better way of doing it? Yeah, sure. But I think in the end, like you know, they they've been through some struggles, right? And and so here, America has so much, right? I think sure. there's there's I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what the solution is. And this is this is absolutely um, not I'm not sure if that's something we want to tread upon. But I know that, you know, being an immigrant, I just at least know that, you know, people were open arms, you know, and it was a different time, um, perhaps. But I just feel like, you know, we we need to get back to that. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, I think that so a, a lot of so over the years, I've talked to a lot of people that came here. You know, not just people that I know, but I'm so I love to talk to like cab drivers and mm. talk to a cab driver in New York one time. Me and you both. <laughs> I'm the one. I'm the chatty Kathy. <laughs> this guy. Well, they always have such interesting stories. Right. And this yeah. guy, a cab driver in New York City one time was explaining how, you know, he was from China. And and uh, I, I might have said this on a previous episode, but um, uh, and it, like his parents arranged, like he went on a high school trip to Canada mm -hmm. and his parents arranged for him to basically like, like duck out of that group mm -hmm. and somebody like picked him up and he got on a boat, like up, you know, way up uh, wherever he was yeah. and, and like, you know, down to New York, mm -hmm. he was like 18 years old, 17 years old in New York, you know, found his way to to Chinatown in New York, got mm -hmm. a job in a restaurant, and mm -hmm. and and uh, actually it wasn't a cab driver. He was a he was an he was an Uber. He was a no. He was a uh, like he worked for he uh, in fact, one of he, the ride I think he something. had his own like car company. Oh, and so, okay, cool. So and he had a family and all that. So uh, but um, and I've known other people, but the, the thing that I wanted to say is a lot of people that I've talked to who have come from other countries. One very common sentiment that they have is they say um, that they're all for people coming here, mm -hmm. but they usually end up saying something like, but they need to do it legally because I did it legally and all my friends did it legally. And mm -hmm. you need to, you, you know, they kind of feel like, like I worked hard to do it the right way. And they're a little bit resentful <clears throat> of all the people who just want to like show up and, and be taken care of. We did. We did it the right way. We had a sponsor, right? And um, I am thankful for that. Yeah. I don't want to say but, right? I, I want to say that we... <laughs> Is that mine? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <it's... laughs> yeah. Oh, she wants you to pick up some fudog dog bit. I, I, I did put it. I, okay. That's <laughs> The building, so All I guess right, he's, so allowed, have to stop he's allowed to call me if he wants to. So, uh, Does he want to join? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I, well, but I kind of I think there's a but in there that I do share, which is um, mm -hmm. there are people who. Uh, so if you're fleeing a really bad situation, mm -hmm. you may not have the means. To do, to do all the of right that way, stuff right? the right way, right? And, and I mean, so you should. So, and you're just if you if you truly are a refugee, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. then sure, you mm -hmm. know, like you should be able to show up at a place like this, mm -hmm. and somebody will help you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then I think where we get into the where people start to get 
Um, so there's a whole bunch of people who are just broadly against the idea of anybody coming here. Like, we got enough people. Well, all right. But then there's people who say, all right, but, like, how many uh, people can we just have, like, like pouring in and I mean I guess again it depends like on their yeah thing, it right? depends on their their perspective too right like have they ever experienced it themselves right and um, Netflix has a bunch of uh, you know new uh, specials and I, I just got done watching uh, the swimmers mm. and I don't know if you've seen that one no, but it should be on your your radar it's about the Olympic swimmer right and she ended up you know swimming for the refugee team in uh, in Rio and um, she was like maybe placed 41 out of the world, yeah. right? And so she made it that far, Pretty but good. she had to leave her country because Syria was, I mean, it was yeah. war torn, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, I guess we don't know every single person's um, story or what right. their their struggles were, but I just know that they are coming to the, the U.S. And I think we have uh, an obligation to our fellow man. Right. And I, I guess over here, if you're talking about, oh, there's there's homeless people. Yes, there are. And they are by choice. Some of them. Sometimes, right. Yeah, sometimes. sometimes they are. And, and, and a lot of times, um, you know, there's th there's just my heart that, that goes to saying, all right, well, there's the immigrant um, population and you do hope that they get processed and you hope that the system will be um, more accommodating to them somehow. But. I don't know. I don't, I don't yeah. know what the answer is. I it's, I, it's, I think sometimes it's just a numbers problem. It's just a. It is a numbers problem, right? Because the sheer numbers of what we have at the right. borders right now, I, I do get that part as a, a means of uh, chaos, right? And um, you have to kind of control that somehow, yeah. right? right? So well, and you have to somehow. And I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to watch the timer, but he put the light thing in front of the timer, so I can't really. Oh, we're down to one oh. minute. <laughs> Actually, it's not even counting. So, really? <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. I have to check my watch. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> so so uh, not my fault. Um, uh, it's, an, it's an upper thing, and I think there's some question, like, I, I think in some people's mind, and certainly in my mind sometimes when I think about this, is I um, is like, okay, where's the balance between... Because you want people... Um, to be able to come here, there is this concept of, you know, of you come to America and you can have a, you know, the American dream, you can have a better life than you might have had. Um, in fact, uh, the guy, the, 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 the guy, the Chinese driver that I, I'm from New York, yeah. one thing he told me, he said, um, he was telling the story of how, you know, his, I mean, his parents basically like, he's in high school and his parents kissed him goodbye because mm -hmm. they wanted him to be able to come here and they arranged for it to be a done. A better life, right? right? And there um, were a lot of risk in between, you know, right. he could have or could not have made right. it, you know? And, and But what one thing he said, he goes, he said to me, and he's speaking of China, and he said, he said, don't believe whatever you hear. Mm -hmm. Everybody over there wants to come over here. Mm -hmm. That was what he mm -hmm. said. Now, to what degree that's true, I don't know, but that was his perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we want that. But at the same time, I think sometimes people think, and certainly it crosses my mind, like, all right, well... But how many people are really in that situation of, mm -hmm. of you know, so you got the category of people who want to come here, they have the means to do it legally, so they do that. You have other people who are fleeing something like Syria or mm -hmm. somewhere else, and so they just show up and they're like, they're just thankful that they even made it this far. Mm -hmm. and what do we do? But then, like, there's kind of a third category mm -hmm. of people, you know, who, like, just that... People, I think, the perception is they're abusing the system. Right? You're right. You know what? And and Michael, this, and how, and this who, is which ones are they? This is right? true. I mean, America is that that still. If you're living outside of America, it's still that golden land of opportunity, right? Yeah. I mean, I go back to Vietnam and people. So you get here. And the you women, realize. yeah, the women still want to marry, you know, uh, yeah. American men so that they can have that right of passage to the U.S. Right, yeah. and so that's yeah. still. A lot of that is still happening, yeah, right? Yeah. I get it. Um, you know, so I don't, I really don't have a, a, a solution. And like you said, everybody has a different story. And I, you know, you can't really microscopically look at everybody's um, situation. But I, I right. just know that, you know, if they do really have a legitimate cause, like they're in um, Guatemala and there's just really, 
nothing there for them, right? And uh, they can come over here and work and make $5 a day, send it back so that it supports some of their families. Yeah. And they're working hard. And they're not and by being the way, a, a menace to society. Taxes a lot of times, right? Correct. You know, correct. And they're, and I mean, uh, yeah. they take on like uh, Social Security so that they can have some of the benefits, but they're still, uh, as a part of that system, they're having to pay into the system, right? Right, right. yeah. And, it, so, it, and in fact, so a lot of people, um, so I heard somebody all get all. But you're right. I mean, going back to what you were saying, like, you, you have to be wary of things that you hear, right? And you have to seek your own truth sure, for yeah. sure, right? And, well, and, and the solution, so you said I don't have a solution, and that is probably true in the sense that each any individual person, like it's not a, it's not the sort of a problem where one person goes, I got it, I worked yeah. it out, I did the math, here's yeah. the solution. It's yeah. like it, it is one of those things that people have to be able to like put a whole bunch of heads together Mm -hmm. Sort it out, and it probably takes time. But if we're so busy, like if if we're if we got if we got one side that's arguing hard over this side, and we got one side that's arguing hard yeah, over this side, yeah, and that's then the other you're never thing. Gonna, uh, yes, and that's it. the other thing too that I I get it where a lot of Americans have have started to lose a faith in their political system, right? Because there's just so much divide. And I feel like the people that are really solving the problems are kind of like your grassroots groups that are actually going out. And politically speaking, I don't care what your thoughts are, but you know what? At least I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something. my part, yeah. right? Oh, this Afghani um, refugee family, I'm going to bring them cups and blankets and whatever it is that they need for their comfortable stay, right? It's, it's stuff like that that I feel like you have to really seek out. You know, I mean, I mean, me, I've always thought that, you know, you you control what is in your locus of control, right? Your molecular, you know, your five by five room or whatever, right? And then you you, you seek out like organizations that can do that and mm -hmm. fight for your cause. I'm not looking for the government to solve my problems, right? And that's I think probably that's good. Yeah. And yes. I've I've been I've always been very anti political just because there's just too much of a spectrum, right? And even in my uh, my MBA class, when we we did the uh, the Washington D.C. trip, we had lobbyist um, uh, speakers come and talk to us mm. about what they do and yeah. uh, lobbyist groups and what. Did they... you understand it after they explained it? Yes, and I just felt so betrayed. <laughs> I'm like, this is wild. This is like, you know, this is legalized um, corruption, right? Yeah, because be. yeah, in yeah. a sense, you've got these interest groups, and they're always going to pay for right. these, you know, influencing yeah. of the of the politicians, right? And um, so, so I sense, yeah. I sense that Chris is getting antsy over here. Should we let him jump in? Because I feel like, I feel like there's something you want to say. He is, uh, he's no, really like, like he's you know, itching like, over there. No, his, I, think we're at, I see his foot on, is, is moving. Got a, right, we got a mic set up for you. So yeah, just, like, come on over. Come on over, and, and then when when we're done with you, we'll we'll send you back. <laughs> <laughs>